we're walking through the book of Genesis, which is made up of these two main parts. And the first part begins in the garden, where we watch humanity spiral downward in self-destruction, and it ends in the Tower of Babel, where a rebellious humanity is scattered by God. Then the second part of Genesis zooms in and focuses on just one family. And right in the middle is this story that links the two parts of Genesis together and helps us understand what the whole book is all about. So how do we get from the Tower of Babel to the story here in the middle? Well, after the scattering at Babel, there's this genealogy, and it follows one of the tribes all the way down to this one guy named Abram. You probably know him as Abraham. And God starts making all these promises to Abraham, like he's going to bless him and give him a ton of kids. And he says that through him and his family, all the nations of the earth are now going to find God's blessing. So basically, God is trying to restore humanity back to the goodness of the garden, and to his original intentions for the world. So it's like his rescue plan for humanity. And that's why the whole second half of Genesis is about this one family. And so you have, you have Abraham, and then he has a son, Isaac, who has Jacob, and then Jacob has 12 sons. And to each generation, God renews his promise to bless them and all nations through them. So because of this promise to use this family to rescue the world, it's pretty easy to read these stories as examples of how to be a good person. But actually, for the most part, this family is totally dysfunctional. So for example, let's go back to Abraham. This whole story is about God giving him and his wife Sarah a family, but two different times. He basically gives Sarah away to other men by denying that she's even his wife. And then Sarah gets impatient about having a son, and so she makes Abraham sleep with her servant girl, which then causes all of these other problems in the family. So they get really old, and you begin to think that there's no way they're going to have a kid of their own. But then, miraculously, they do. It's Isaac. And Isaac, he has two sons, Esau and Jacob, and it seems like things are going pretty good. But Jacob... The younger brother wants the family's inheritance, which belongs to Esau, the older brother. So he devises a plan where he's going to steal it from his father, Isaac, who at this point in the story is now old and blind. Which who does that horrible stealing from your blind father? Yeah, and then he just takes off. So Jacob goes on from there to have 12 sons, big family. But Jacob loves his 11th son, Joseph, way more than all the others. And so he gives him the special technicolor dream coat and his brothers because of this come to hate him so much so that they, they plan on killing him but they don't they instead just sell him as a slave down in egypt now while in egypt through this crazy series of events joseph goes from being in a prison cell to becoming the second in command there and so later on the the whole middle east falls into this food shortage and joseph's brothers they come down to egypt looking for food and then when they get there who should they find as the ruler of the whole land? It's Joseph, that guy they sold into slavery. But he actually saves them from starving to death. And so here you have it. These are the great grandchildren of Abraham who have done this heinous act to their brother. But God has transformed their evil into something good. And that's exactly what Joseph says here in the last paragraph of the entire book. He says, you guys planned all of this for evil, but God planned it for good, to save people's lives. Now these words, they conclude the book because they actually summarize the message of the whole story so far. Humans keep choosing evil, and we are thinking they're, they're screwing up God's plan, but he keeps turning their evil back into good. And somehow, he's going to use this family to restore humanity back to the garden. So that's the book of Genesis. But we still don't know how exactly he's going to use this family to bring us back to the garden. Well, yeah, but this is just the first book, so that's what the rest of the Bible sets out to answer. Hey there, I'm Tim. And this is John. We believe the best way to understand... I love Tim and John, but we don't need to... We have very short time, so... Um, okay. This week, we did that discussion prompt from Isaiah... And even though our time is short, I do, uh, I really love that passage. I want to hear if y'all got anything out of that uh, from Isaiah 54, if you had the time to look at it. No one looked at it? Just me? Didn't understand it? Okay. 
Okay. Uh, so that's the prophecy. Um, so, you know, Isaiah is prophesying like around 722. So this is when the northern kingdom is going to fall to Assyria. And he's using them as uh, sort of um, an example to the southern kingdom of Judah, who's not going to fall for another almost 200 years, 150 years or so. Um, but he's also like uh, giving them a future promise. Um, that, that, yeah, you're going to pay for your sins and you broke the Mosaic Covenant and we're going to talk all about the Mosaic Covenant in the future and the repercussions for breaking it and all those things were going to come to pass and all the curses that God promises in Deuteronomy are going to come on the nation of Israel. They're going to be scattered. It's the whole diaspora thing. But then in the end, he's going to bring them back. He's going to restore the nation and he compares that time, uh, the, this eschatological promise to Israel, he compares it to the days of Noah. And he says, this is going to be like the days of Noah when I destroyed everyone, but I made a covenant with him. And so when, when we think of, the reason I kind of wanted us to think about this this week, here's what I get when I think about this passage and compare it to uh, the story of Noah, is when I read Genesis 9 uh, to understand the Noahic covenant, what I get out of it is that God's not going to flood the world again. Like that's what he says he's going to do, Right? When I go and take that promise forward to Isaiah 54, it's as if the, my understanding of the Noahic Covenant is expanding to something that is so much greater than just not flooding the world, but a promise of dwelling with people in peace and safety. And it is, it's that uh, like eschatological understanding that I think gives it its place of fulfillment in Jesus. Because if it's just about not flooding the world, how is it even really a Christological prophecy? You know what I mean? Like, I'm not flooding the world either. Am I fulfilling the Noahic covenant? Well, not when you understand that it's a covenant of peace and it's this, this eschatological thing of God dwelling with people uh, in peace and in safety. Totally. Yeah. 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 And you get this, um, uh, we don't see it yet because it's the first of many cycles. And so right now it, it, it <clears throat> is just an event that happened and we don't see it as part of a larger cycle. But it is the first time God saves a remnant out of destruction. And so we're going to see this whole thing of remnant. It's going to come up later in Genesis with uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. It's going to come up in the um, uh, uh, captivity of Babylon. Like God's going to save a remnant out of that. And it's that whole idea of the remnant and going back to, you know, this tree is cut down, but the stump of Jesse remains. And God's going to bring a shoot out of the stump of Jesse. And it's this con deeply connected to the Davidic covenant. Um, Christological prophecy that Jesus fulfills. Um, so it, it just becomes, it takes the Noahic covenant from uh, God's not going to flood the world again and, and just kind of like blossoms it out into this amazing picture of what Jesus is going to do, what he's going to fulfill both in his first coming and uh, in the end times. So that's kind of what I get when I read Isaiah 54 in light of uh, Genesis 9, and it helps me get a much fuller understanding of what the Noahic Covenant's all about. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Yeah, so um, she said part of it in verses 9 and 10 is, the, is a promise that God's going to protect Israel forever. So let's take that in light of the Levitical covenant where God promises there will always be a priest and in light of the Davidic covenant where God promises there will always be a king. So if you take those three covenants, he's promising that there will always be Israel, always be a priest, and always be a king. Have those three things been true across history? Definitely not. So, like, what do we do with that? And how do we see Jesus in light of those three things not being true across history as he's going to bring them into a even deeper actuality in the end times? We're not talking about end times tonight. Uh, we're diving into Genesis uh, chapter 12, and um, I do want to move a little bit quickly here. So, uh, Genesis chapter 12, we read 1 through 3 last week. We ended on that. <clears throat> And um, I think it was really great. Uh, we saw God's promise to Abram. And uh, remember, what are we looking for? The seed, the, the offspring uh, that is going to undo the curse and bring about this uh, new way of being a person, if we want to think about it that way, right? This new way of uh, essentially ushering back in Eden, okay? Um, so now we have arrived. Well, we talked about Abel. He wasn't it. He got murdered. Uh, it, was it Seth? Well, he, he wasn't the seed. Um, we went on down his lineage. We got to, um, who did we get to next? Noah. And he kind of, uh, sort of did it with getting rid of the curse of the ground, but not fully because he then followed in the same footsteps as Adam, right? Um, so now we're uh, continuing down the line and we get to Abram and God makes this great promise to him. And it's this, like we saw in the video, it's like they're going back into Eden and Abram is going to be the guy to usher in this new Edenic relationship with God, how it was supposed to be from the beginning. And so let's see uh, what he does. Um, he goes into Canaan. Oh yeah, and I, I wanted to pull this up too, just so we have, you probably have some maps in your Bible, but I like to think in terms of maps, it really helps me. Um, if you look down here in the bottom right corner, if you can see that over here or over there, uh, you see Babylonia and Ur right underneath where it says Sumer there. Um, so that is Ur of the Chaldeans, where the Tower of Babel uh, would have been around this area. If you go all the way up uh, the Euphrates River, you see where it says like Assyria and then Mitanni. Uh, under Mitanni, uh, in little writing, you see Haran. So that's where, they, that's where Abram's family traveled as they left Ur. They went west, uh, got to Haran, and that's where Abram's dad died. And then uh, Abram, this is where uh, Genesis 12, 1 through 3 takes place, um, where he is going to continue on into Canaan. And so, uh, he, Lot, he takes Lot with him. He's 75 years old. He departs Haran. He has Sarai, his wife. He has Lot. And he has a bunch of possessions uh, that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran. Um, and that's kind of an important line. It doesn't seem like it yet, but as we go through this story of, uh, of Abraham and how Israel starts out, acquiring people and acquiring wealth from these other nations is going to become something very important and uh, like a key uh, touch point in Abram's life, if that makes sense. Uh, so they acquired a bunch of people in Haran. Somehow, we don't know the story of how that happened. Uh, they went through the land. They got to the oak uh, of Moray, and uh, they were in the Canaanites' land. And God says this in verse 7, to your offspring, I will give this land. Okay, so we have now, God took him out of a place and in in his father's authority away from those people, right? If you're going to have a kingdom, you need land, you need people in the land, and then you need someone to rule over those people in that land. You need those three things to have a kingdom or a nation, right? And so what God has done here in this one verse to your offspring, well, there's people, I will give this land. So there's two of the three things that you need to have a nation, and the implication is that Abram, being the guy that this is being spoken to, is going to have that rule and authority over the nation. So in this one verse, we just see the development of essentially an entirely new, new nation. This is the land that I'm going to give to your offspring. And he builds an altar, he worships God there, and the place is called Bethel, um, and then the story keeps going. And there was a famine in the land. Okay, now hold on. What are we looking for? We're looking for an offspring. And Abraham was just told, I'm going to give this land to your offspring, right? And so in that, we even see this echo of the promise of Genesis 3. Um, 
and it's going to take place in this land. But what does Abram do when there is a famine? He goes down to Egypt. Okay, so like it was so hopeful for a second there. It's like we have this Genesis 3 promise. We got to Genesis 12, like this is the end of the Bible, and we're going to see the promise fulfilled. And then he just leaves the land that was just promised. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Right. And we're going to get to Ishmael next week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so the famine was severe in the land. He was about to enter Egypt. And Sarai, his wife, he said, I know that you're a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they'll say, this is his wife. Let's kill him. Okay, so different culture, right? Um, and so uh, in order to save my life, um, now what's, what's really going on, I think, in Abraham's heart here? What was he just told? He was just told, you're going to have offspring. I'm going to give them this land. Does he have kids? No. So God's promise cannot be fulfilled if Abraham is killed, right? So Abraham is protecting himself from being killed. He says, if they, they're, they're going to kill me because of how beautiful you are if they know that you're my wife. So I have to take the promise of God into my own hand to make sure that this gets fulfilled. This is going to become very thematic in the life of Abraham as well. What's that? Thank you, Fred. Way to just point out all my flaws. Okay. Um, and that happened. He told them they were his, that she was his sister. Um, okay, where's, where's this thing? Okay, but the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues. Okay, so there's a famine in, in Israel. Okay, it's the land of Canaan. We're just going to, it's also the land of Israel later on, right? Because it's the promised land. God has just promised it. When we say promised land, it's not like it's the promised land or anything. It's, this is the promised land, the land that was promised, okay? This is, it's important to kind of take that, um, not, not just, I don't even know how to describe it. I didn't understand this for the longest time. Because um, I was just like, oh yeah, the promised land. It's just, it is what it is. I never really, like, it, the, the, the connection didn't take place in my brain that the promised land is the land that is promised to Abraham and his offspring. And that becomes really important in how we ultimately apply the story of the Torah into our own lives. Uh, and we're going to talk about that as the story goes on. Um, so the, there's a famine in Israel, and the Israelites... Uh, I know he's not at this point, but you're with me, uh, goes to Egypt, and then the Egyptians get struck with great plagues. What's going on here? Y'all who know the story and have read the Bible before, this is, this is Exodus, right? Sure, sure, but, but connect it. Ex you're 100% right. You're 100% right. But I'm thinking, literarily, what can we connect this story to? Because we know the story. We've read, even if we haven't read it in this much detail, you've read the Torah before, most of you, and you're familiar with the Exodus story and the 10 plagues and, and the famine in Israel that, you know, Genesis 37 through 50, the famine in Israel, they go down there and Joseph is the ruler and all these things. This is, well, that is a cycle. You might not have ever realized that that was a cycle, but that is a cycle of something that takes place here first. You see that? It's, this is the prequel. But the prequels usually aren't good. Um, this one is better. Um, or maybe worse. I don't know. Um, okay, and Pharaoh, uh, they sent him away, his wife, and all that he had. Okay, and Abraham... Uh, went up from Egypt, and now into chapter 13, and his wife and everything that he had, and he was rich in livestock and silver and gold. Now, how did he get to be rich in livestock and silver and gold? His wife, okay. What's that? Exactly. So when they, when they left uh, Egypt, so they praised her. Uh, is that where it is? 16? 
he had sheep and oxen, male servants, female servants, female donkeys and camels, so he got rich in Egypt. Okay, well that also is part of the cycle that's going to happen then in Exodus. So Abraham, who gets wealthy off of Egypt, has so much stuff that he can no longer dwell together with Lot because Lot also has a whole bunch of stuff. And I think uh, you might be familiar with this story. Uh, the land could not support both of them dwelling together for their possessions were so great and there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Um, and then it just gives us this little detail that at that time the Canaanites and Perizzites were dwelling in the land. And I don't know why that's important in the story of Abraham and Lot, but I do think that's important to the story for the people who this is being told to. Because if you remember that this is being written to Israel, after they've come out of Egypt, Moses is giving this to them in the wilderness, possibly the first generation at Mount Sinai, possibly the second generation in the plains of Moab. We don't know exactly when this would have been written, but that's not a detail that matters for this story, but it is a detail that would have mattered to the original audience. Does that make sense? Okay. And so that just gives us that little bit of like, oh yeah, we are stepping into a cross-cultural exercise when we read our Bibles. Um, and so Abraham says to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me. The whole land is before you. You choose. You choose, Lot. Where do you want to live? And you go and you take that place. And where did Lot choose to go live? He went east. That's exactly the answer I was looking for. Everyone else said Sodom, but you got it. He went east. So this is, this is important. Why is this important? Because east... East is maybe not always bad, but East is definitely a biblical theme. And when we see it, we, we are thinking Adam and Eve left the garden to the East. Uh, when the Israelites go into the promised land, they go from the East to the West over the Jordan River. When you enter into the tabernacle, you go from the East to the West. So going West is this picture of entering into the presence of God and going East is this picture of exiting the presence of God. And so he journeys East. And then he does settle in Sodom. The rest of you weren't wrong. Uh, he does settle in Sodom. Um, I was just looking for the biblical theme. Um, and so the Lord says to Abram, now Lot is separated from him. Lift up your eyes, the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward and all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. And I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and breadth of the land for I will give it to you. So Abraham moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. Okay. So what is, we, the Abrahamic covenant comes sort of in three parts. We talked about the Noahic covenant last week, and, and that really just takes place there in Genesis 9. It's sort of encapsulated in that one little uh, bit there in Genesis 9, but the Abrahamic covenant is sort of spread out. You have the call of Abraham that takes place in Genesis 12. We read that at the end of last week's class. Uh, then you have this covenant that God makes with Abraham in this really strange scene, which we're going to get to in chapter 15. And then you have chapter 17, which is how we're going to end tonight's class, um, which maybe is a weird place to end because we're going to talk a lot about circumcision. And anyway, that's just a weird place to, to end. But um, the Abrahamic covenant is sort of spread out. And so the, what we just saw, what we just read is, uh, I'm going to make your offspring like the dust of the earth. This is all part of this promise of the Abrahamic covenant, Right. Um, even though it's not in one of those three places, this is going to come up over and over and over again. And in fact, the Abrahamic covenant is going to come up even after Abraham dies because God is going to continue to renew this covenant with the offspring of Abraham. Uh, Isaac is going to get similar promises to what Abraham gets. Jacob is, uh, the, the 12 sons. Uh, we're just going to kind of continually see that language. I'm going to make your offspring uh, like the dust of the earth, like the sand of the seashore, like the stars of the heavens. This different language, poetic language comes up in all these different places. Um, how are we doing? Okay, yes. We're going to get to that tonight. Yep. You're, I love it. You're ahead of me. You're doing great. Uh, chapter 14. Good? Good? Oh, sorry. Get me. Hit me.
No, you're good. Totally. Yeah. Mm. That's a really cool point. I'm just going to say that again for anyone who couldn't hear. So he's talking about how Lot lifted his eyes. Uh, and it's this sort of repetition of Eve in the garden, how she saw the fruit. But Abraham didn't look up. God had to tell him to look up and to see the land. And so the way that we've talked about this in the class in Uganda is uh, where Abraham was walking by faith, Lot was walking by sight. And so we do kind of make that distinction. And, and if, you, if you make that distinction, if that's something you want to walk with, you can really tie that to characters throughout Genesis as the story goes on. You can say, oh, look at the ways that this person's walking by faith. Look at the ways that this person's walking by sight. And, and that can really help you sort of um, classify maybe the events of the story as they're going on. Awesome point. All right, chapter 14. In the days of Amraphel, king of where? Shinar. Shinar, where Shinar? Babylon. Babylon. Okay, so um, by nature of him being listed first, he is the leader of these kings. Are you with me? So he is, he is the leader, right? Okay, just trust me. <laughs> Ariot, king of Elisar, Chedorlamer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goam. So we have these uh, four kings. Then there's these other kings. Did I get them all? Amraphel, Ariok, Chedorlamer, and Tidal. Okay, and then you have these other kings. Bera, king of Sodom, Bershah, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. So we have four kings led by Babylon, and we have five kings led by Sodom. So Babylon is attacking Sodom. Okay, um, but hold on, because... In verse 4, it says, 12 years they had served Chedorlamer, okay? In the 14th year, Chedorlamer and the kings who were with him. So it does not say Amraphel and the kings who were with him. It says Chedorlamer and the kings who were with him. So of those four, okay, are you following me? Are we together so far? Are you sticking with this? Of those four, Amraphel, king of Shinar, is mentioned first, but it actually says that Chedorlamer, king of Elam, is in charge, so why is Amraphel, king of Shinar, listed first when we get to Genesis chapter 14? Huh? Good one. No. Um, it, I, think, I think it is to uh, point out the significance of Babylon in, the, in how the biblical story is developing, right? For the same reason, uh, we talked about last week, you know, why if, if the nations didn't divide and the languages didn't divide until after the Tower of Babel, why does Genesis 10 come before Genesis 11? And I think that that is in order to put the making their own name great in Genesis 11 and God making Abram's name great in Genesis 12 closer together on the scroll so that it would be noticed more easily. So the b biblical authors seem to be willing to reorder some things in order to draw attention to important points. And it seems like these kings have been reordered because Chedorlaomer is in charge, but Amraphel is listed first in order to draw our attention to the fact that Babylon is coming against and about to take into captivity the family of Abram. So Babylon taking into captivity the family of Abram is something that's going to happen in 586 BC when they come and take Judah into captivity, right? So this is a cycle, a, a starting point of cycles, okay? I love this. So cool. Amraphel? He, he would be listed again uh, in verse 9, Shadorlamer, king of Elam, right there, Amraphel, king of Shinar. Yep, yep. Yeah, not here. <laughs> okay, so four kings come against five kings, and they defeat them, and they take all the possessions of Sada and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. Have you ever read this chapter before? Isn't it just the most annoying chapter to read? Because there's these nine names who you don't know and don't care about what happens to them, and it's impossible to read. So just a pro tip, four kings versus five kings, and stop reading the names, okay? All right. 
Um, they take all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions. They went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions. And then uh, one who escaped came back and told Abram the Hebrew. Uh, so this is the first time uh, that Abram is called a Hebrew. And you remember last week we came across that name in the genealogies, Eber. And I said, we think that this is maybe where the name Hebrew comes from. Well, if you look over here at the, uh, it's, maybe it's hard to see, but on the very right side of the screen there, where is the information column? It says Ebri. Um, those are the Hebrew letters that would be transliterated in English, E-B-R. And so we think Eber and Hebrew are related. Um, so this is the first time Abram is called a Hebrew. Um, maybe that's important to you. So I'm pointing it out. And he was living in the same place he was living last chapter. Um, he heard uh, of this, and his, that his kinsmen had been taken captive, and he led forth men from his house, 318 of them. Do you think that these 300 men had anything on the armies of Babylon and these other three places? Probably not. And they went in pursuit as far as Dan. We just had a big problem in our reading of the Bible. Did you notice it? <laughs> Dan didn't exist yet. Okay, so, um, pretty cool, huh? <laughs> so, I'm not sneaky, Moses did it. <laughs> So they went in pursuit as far as Dan. So Moses is obviously um, telling a story that involves the tribes in which he's writing to. But even in that, we have a problem. Because when Moses is writing this, where is Dan? They're in the wilderness. They haven't yet settled in the land that they would be living in. They don't do that until the end of Joshua and Moses is long gone. Yes. What language? Uh, maybe less so at this time. Um, certainly the languages would have been divided at the Tower of Babel, right? And s potentially, I, I would, why wouldn't they? Everyone else got one. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yep. They're all, they're all, uh, what's it called? Semitic. I was going to say Ugaritic, but no, it's Semitic root. Yeah. Yeah. They're all Semitic languages. Not necessarily adopted, but in the same way that the longer the USA and Mexico are side by side, the closer English and Spanish become when you're living in a place like El Paso, right? It's that same sort of etymological blending of languages that's going on. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, American English is not the same as British English. <laughs> Good point. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, everyone who left with his. Yeah. All the, all the people who left Babylon in that same direction that his dad did up towards Haran would have probably had the same at least root language, and if it had split off from that, um, certainly. But yeah, yeah, language is funny. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah. So what happens in Joshua is they actually cast lots to decide which tribe gets to live in what area. So they hadn't talked about it beforehand. Um, and so what you get here, I think, well, let's talk about it a little bit more first. I saw a hand over here first.
So the territories before the Israelites moved in and conquered were the Perizzites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Perizzites. Like it was, the, it was those uh, nations. So the borders of the tribes doesn't come around until the end of Joshua when Moses is long gone. And that's my point about this is we are arriving at a biblical hiccup because Moses doesn't know this information to write it down. Maybe. That's one explanation. I think, do you want to go ahead? Maybe. So it could be, so, mm-hmm. so I think this is one of the first instances that we have in the Bible of what's called postscript editing. It's not in italics, but why would it be in italics? If it was added in by the translators from the Hebrew to the English, it would be in italics. Well, the original word is Dan. Because <laughs> that's a Hebrew name. <laughs> and so I, th- I think what's going on here is, is long after the writing of Genesis, uh, you have people who want to preserve the writing of Genesis. And you have scribes who are, um, you know, not everyone back in the day went to school and learned how to write. And if you were going to be a scribe, you went to a special school. And one of the ways you learned how to write is you would take your little wedge-shaped utensil and you would get a soft piece of clay. And your teacher or your, or your scribal leader would, uh, would read or recite something to you and you would write it down. And uh, this is actually those small little clay stones that scribes used to practice on is, makes up a large portion of the original biblical text that we actually have. Um, and, but the problem is students make mistakes. And so these little clay tablets are filled with errors. But we have so many of them that we can compare them and figure out which ones have errors and which ones don't, um, or not which ones don't, but what, like what words are are commonly written one way, we can figure out that that's the correct way to write the word. And so we have all these textual variants and things, but um, as time went on, um, they wouldn't want to forget what the locations were that were going on in the story. And so I think what we have is a problem, like maybe intertestamental or possibly even earlier postscript edit by a scribe or a monk that was preserving the location of the story in such a way that Moses wouldn't have actually written down himself. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Some people have a big problem with that. It depends what you mean by original. But yeah, but yeah. I mean, so either it's a prophecy and it was, because we have another example where Isaiah mentions Xerxes by name, right? Um, And we believe that that's a prophecy. So why couldn't we believe that this is a prophecy? And my explanation is, well, we could believe, excuse me, that this is a prophecy. I think it's more likely that this is original language, but not necessarily written by Moses. Yeah. Entirely possible. Entirely possible. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Moses wasn't a witness to any of what what this is. Yeah. So we have, I would love to recommend a book to you. It's called The Journey from Text to Translations. And if you're really interested in like, how do we get from clay tablets and papyrus to the book that we have, that's the book you want to read. The Journey from Text to Translations. Um, It's a little bit scholarly, but it'll get you there. Um, It'll get you a really nice understanding of how we get and can trust the Bible that we have. Um, There's also, uh, I'm also going to send out a YouTube link with tomorrow's email from the class that's going to have a lecture by Tim Mackey on a similar topic of why we can trust the Bible that we have, given that we have more 
textual variants than there are words in the New Testament for the New Testament. So like, how do we trust a book like that? Yeah. So my reason for pointing this out is to say, are we okay with the idea that our Bible has been edited in between when it was originally written and when it was translated into English? Because it seems like what we have here, in my mind, maybe I'm wrong and, and you know, open-handed grip on this. It seems to me like we have some postscript editing going on in this verse. Sure. Yep. And I, I absolutely 100% agree with that. And it's really the reason why I'm comfortable saying that I'm okay with postscript editing. Because if the Holy Spirit was involved with Moses, why wasn't he involved with other, the, 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 the thousands and thousands of nameless scribes who preserved this throughout the years, right? Yeah. So watch that video that I'm going to send out. That I, I feel like is from an, from an evangelistic standpoint, he does a really great job of saying like, this is why we can trust the Bible. And this is actually how textual variants make it so that we can trust it even more. And so if you're into this topic, I'm going to send out that video link uh, with the email tomorrow. If you're not into this topic and you're like, let's move on and get back to the story of Abram, give us like one more minute and then we will. So, well, so in the original language, it's Dan, but would Moses have written Dan? That's the question. That's the question. Mo if it's a prophecy, Moses might have written Dan, but the rest of this text isn't reading like a prophecy, it's reading like a narrative. And so I don't have any reason to think it's a prophecy outside of just the fact that it's so specific. That's why I would lean towards, and, and it, there's textual criticism behind this, but it's why I would lean towards postscript editing. But some people have a major problem with that, and they really have a hard time going, well, Moses wrote most of it, but then someone down the road changed it, and they think that makes it less trustworthy. But to Mark's point, I think the Holy Spirit is in the preservation just as much as in the authorship. And so, totally. Yeah, absolutely. You had your hand up, Rachel. Right. That's a great point. Like if we were to modernize uh, Tom Sawyer, for example, we would include details that weren't in the original, even in the same language, and it would preserve the story in a way that we would understand rather than compromise the story. That's a great, great way to think about it, yeah. Okay, back to the story of Abraham. Cool. Um, and he divided his forces against them by night, and he defeated them, and he brought back all their possessions and his kinsmen lot with his possessions and the women and the people. Um, okay, so Abraham goes out and he defeats Babylon and the other armies that are with him. After his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. How many kings went out to meet Abraham? Two. Okay. Um, 
I'm just going to ask this up front, even though you don't understand why yet. As we go through the story, I think you will, but I want to tie this into the biblical themes that we've been working on. How many trees were in the, garden, in the midst of the Garden of Eden? Two. How many kings go out to meet Abram? Two. Okay, and I think that we are going to see some of that theme of the duality of blessing and cursing going on in this story, okay? Um, Melchizedek... Uh, Let's see. I want to come over here. Oh, yeah, I need to save this. Um, untitled on the desktop. That's fine. And then give me a new one. Okay, Melchizedek. Um, comes from two Hebrew words. Melech means king. And then Zadok means righteousness, king and righteousness. And when you read Hebrews and it talks about Melchizedek, he talks about by virtue of his name, he's the king of, he's the king of uh, Salem, a king of peace, and then by virtue of his name, king of righteousness. Well, this is what the author of Hebrews is getting at. He's actually looking at the original language and going, oh, his name means king and righteousness. Uh, this name right here, Zadok, is actually also the name of the priest who was loyal to David in the conflict with, is it Abimelech at the beginning of? Anyways, um, so you have King David and then you have his priest uh, with the Melchizedek sort of playing off each other like that as well. It's really cool uh, what's going on in that story. So Melchizedek is these two words put together, king of righteousness. Um, and then, so he comes, and what does he offer? Bread and wine. Uh, what's that? It's communion. Okay, so the king of peace, who is by his name also the king of righteousness, goes to Abraham after this battle where he redeems his kinsmen from Babylon and offers him communion. Like if, I can't express biblical themes any more clearly than that to make you go, oh, this is the gospel, right? Okay, so he brings out bread and wine, and then, just in case it wasn't clear enough, it tells us he was priest of God Most High. So not only is his name the same name that connects him to David's priest, but he himself is a king and a priest. Are you with me? And that is uh, messianic to its core. Christophany. Yeah. Um, I don't think he was, but I'm not going to like open-handed. I have, because I, wanted, I want to try to get to a Hebrew understanding of the spiritual realm, which is ours is God, angels, demons, right? A Hebrew's understanding is like spiritual beings everywhere. Some are good, some are bad, some are neutral, some are Yahweh, some are Balak. Yes, but Christ is uh, the Old Testament Christ and the New Testament Jesus of Nazareth. While Jesus of Nazareth is the fulfillment of every Old Testament Christological messianic prophecy, there are two different ideas. Yeah, that's how Hebrews puts it. Yeah, one is a shadow of things to come. But um, in the way that Jesus of Nazareth is a man, who is also the fulfillment of, of all these Old Testament prophecies, but these Old Testament prophecies go beyond a man into the church and into eschatology. And you're going to see messianic, messianic prophecies in the Old Testament that either have not yet been fulfilled by Jesus, speaking eschatologically like they will, or there are messianic prophecies in the Old Testament that are specific to Israel, being God's son rather than Jesus being God's son. And those ones in particular are very important to kind of see ways in which the church is attached, not replace, right? Not replacement theology, attachment theology grafted into the same tree. The in ways in which the church is attached to, to that messianic prophecy and is the fulfillment of that prophecy in the world rather than, and I'm really stepping on eggshells to say this, rather than actually Jesus. 
hold on, we got a hand over here and then we'll come over to this side. Was Jesus a king or will Jesus be a king? Right? <laughs> but am I though? But, but am I? Because I want to see how Jesus, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But did he ever do in his earthly ministry, what a king did? Not once. <laughs> Fair, but, but as far as him being a king, and I'm 100%, yes, Jesus is king of kings, lord of lords, right? 100%. I don't want to argue against that at all. In his earthly ministry, in his first coming, did he do that? That's why the Pharisees didn't believe he was who he said he was, because they were expecting a king. <laughs> Right, right. And certainly what we expected him to do, right? But even just what a king does. He didn't do anything a king does. He didn't rule. Like that's the defining characteristic of a king. That's what made uh, Adam and Eve, the pictures of the, of the kingship of God in the garden was the, the shared authority of the, you are gonna rule earth. That's what made them that image of kings. Jesus doesn't do that. We're getting a, a little bit off track here, but I, I, kinda, I did expect that question about a Christophany, although I didn't really fully prepare for it. I'm going to say, I think he's a pre-type. I think he's a pre-type rather than Jesus himself. And if you want to argue against me on that, I'm totally happy for you to take a different view. <laughs> cool? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So a theophany, so the theos is the Greek word for God. So it depends on what you mean. If, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, God, yeah, definitely. We're going to talk a little bit about what, yes, I absolutely, I believe in the theophany. I am not even opposed to a Christophany. I just think that sometimes we apply it where the biblical authors don't intend it. And so my thing is, I just want to be careful of saying, this is a Christophany, when I'm going, did Moses think this was a Christophany? Did he think this was a theophany? Or is this just the king of Salem, which would later become Jerusalem, and he was also a priest, which makes him an awesome and super clear pre-type, but it seems like in this story, this guy's not even a spiritual being. He's just a king, right? And so I just... I'm not opposed to anyone saying it's a Christophany. I'm willing to go down that road. I'm not going to necessarily take it there for myself. Will, you had your hand up. Did you want to? Yes, next week, because this week we're stopping at 17. Yeah. I do, but I would love to hear your question too. So this is the first time we're seeing a priest, right? By name, I think, I think you're right. Yeah, Genesis fourteen eighteen is the first mention of priests. priests haven't been established yet. Yeah. Oh, great point. Yeah. So, were there priests in other religions? And then it was like, hey, you know, it's really a priest. Like, like the good I mean, yes, there definitely were priests in other religions, but I, th I think, man, I had never thought about this before, but isn't, wouldn't it be like so, it would make so much more sense of the whole Dan thing if that was added later, if the priest thing was like Moses knows what's going on here, and this is more of a note from Moses, and then that's, I need to spend some time thinking about that. I was not prepared for that question at all. <laughs> yes, Jethro. Yeah, he was the priest of Midian. Yep. Yeah, when did that start? Great question. Well, the priesthood predates Leviticus. 
that starts, because the tribe of Levi co comes around at the end of Genesis, but then there's the whole thing with the golden calf in Exodus, where they're called uh, out of the other 11 tribes to be loyal to God. Anyways, let's uh, press on into Melchizedek. Uh, so king, he was a priest. He was the king of peace. That is the meaning of Salem. It would later become Jerusalem. And he was also the priest of God Most High. So he, it's basically just uh, messianic prophecy out the wazoo. That's what we want to take away from this, okay? Uh, and he says, uh, and he blessed him and said, uh, blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a, ta a tithe, that's the word there, tenth, uh, of everything. That's not the Hebrew word, but it's uh, what's the idea. Um, and the king of Sodom. Okay, so now the other king. He says to Abram, okay, so what does the first king do? The king of Salem, he gives things to Abram, bread and wine, and then he blesses him. Okay, and now the king of Sodom says, give me. Okay, you see the contrast between the two kings? One is giving to Abram, the other says, give me. Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourselves. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to Yahweh, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Isn't that exactly the same language that Melchizedek just blessed Abram with in the previous uh, couple verses back? that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. And I think that's really cool because Abram doesn't let his own qualms and his own convictions uh, take away from the people who are with him, right? He's providing for the army that went with him, uh, but let Aner, Eschol, and Mamre take their share. And that is the end of the story. So you had the two kings, one gave, one wanted to take, but also give with some malintent, it seems, based on Abraham's response to him. And then you have uh, the blessing uh, of one, and then what Abram uh, uh, seems to have thought would have been the curse of another to be able to say that I got rich off of Abram. So you have these contrasting kings in the way that we had those contrasting trees, um, and then you have all the messianic stuff that's wrapped up in this. Melchizedek is like very, very mysterious in the Old Testament. And then whoever wrote Hebrews seems to know a lot about Melchizedek that I, don't, I would have written it differently if that was all the information I have, but awesome, right? Holy Spirit inspired more. Cool. What do you got? Uh-huh. The king of Sodom. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Huh. That's super interesting. Yeah, totally. Um, we're a little bit behind. Cool. Press on. Let's talk about covenants. After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abraham in a vision. Okay, so uh, does Yahweh appear to Abraham? The word of Yahweh came to Abraham in a vision. Okay, we are entering into a section of chapters which is going to shine a lot of light uh, onto our very small American 21st century minds about what ancient Hebrews thought about the spiritual realm. So Yahweh does not appear to God. The word of Yahweh comes, sorry, Yahweh doesn't appear to Abram. The word of Yahweh comes to Abram in a vision. And here's what he says, fear not, I'm your shield, I'm your very great reward. Okay, very prescient uh, um, message from the Lord, given what just took place in the last chapter, right? Um, I'm your shield. I'm your very great. He just took 318 men against four armies. So yeah, God's his shield. Okay. But Abram said, oh, Yahweh Elohim. Uh, sorry, that's not Yahweh. Oh, El Adonai Elohim. Uh, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. What has God promised to give to Abram? 
offspring like the dust of the earth. Like they can't even be counted. And he's like, yo, I don't even have one. Like, you're telling me I'm gonna have a multitude. I don't even have one. Okay, so what's the implication in this question? It's accusation. God, you have not done what you said you would do. You're my shield and my reward. That's great. Why don't you do what you said you would do? <laughs> Are you with me? Okay. <laughs> um, and Abram said, behold, you have given me no offspring. What are we looking for? Offspring. And a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son will be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look at the heavens and the number of the stars, if you're able to number them. And he said, so shall your offspring be. And this is an important one. He believed Yahweh and he counted it to him as righteousness. Uh, that's so important because Paul is basically going to make his dissertation to the Roman church off of this one verse. So if you're into Romans, this is like its foundation, okay? Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, and he said, I, uh, I, Yahweh, I am Yahweh, who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave you this land. And he said, how will I know that I'm going to possess it? What was his first question? I don't have any kids. What are the three things you need to have a nation? You need to have a ruler. Abram's there. We got that. Check. He doesn't have people. He doesn't have land. So the first question is, are you going to give me kids like you said you would? And the next question is, how do I know that I'm going to possess this land? You see what's on Abraham's mind is that call from chapter 12, right? Those three things. You have to have the ruler and the land and the people. So how do I know I'm going to possess the land? And here's what he says. Bring me a heifer three years old and a female goat three years old and a ram three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And we're like, great. Those five animals are definitely going to tell Abraham he's going to possess the land, right? This is nonsense. Okay, how do I know I'm going to possess the land? Bring me these five animals and cut them in half. But don't cut the birds in half, just break them so that they bleed, but they don't get feathers everywhere. <laughs> and when the birds of prey come down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. So this is nuts. This is just insane what's going on here. It doesn't make any sense to us. Um, and yet there are, in the making of this covenant, there are so many echoes of this in our modern day marriage ceremonies. Um, it's, it's kind of crazy. Uh, okay, so the sun goes down, darkness falls, and Abraham's scared, and the Lord, and now the Lord said to Abraham, so the word of the Lord, we're done with that. Now it's Yahweh speaking to Abraham, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and will be afflicted for how long? 400 years. What is this prophecy talking about? Egypt. Okay. Um, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they will come out with what? Great possessions. So uh, getting the prophecy of the cycle of what happened back in chapter 12. And as for you, you'll go to your fathers in peace. You'll be buried in a good old age. Well, that sounds nice for Abraham. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation. Why? For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Woo. What is the purpose for the Egyptian slavery of 400 years? It's because one of the seven nations that God is going to judge with the conquest of Israel into the land of Canaan, th their iniquity is not yet complete, meaning God is having patience on the sin of his enemies. Isn't that wild? Yeah, like the hundred years Noah was building the ark. He's like waiting for more people to stop sinning and turn and like follow him. But he's going to give the Amorites 400 years before he takes Israel out of Egypt and then goes and murders everyone with him. Like Isaiah 54. You're the best, Jacob. Thank you. <laughs> Love it. Uh, okay. Now the sun had gone down and it was dark and behold. Okay, so um, verse 18 says, On that day the Lord, Yahweh, made a covenant with Abram. All right, so uh, what we expect in this covenant, uh, in the ancient Israelite context, is that um, 
whenever you make an agreement that is uh, like, if someone breaks it, it's their blood on the line. Here's what you do. You take an animal, you cut it in half, you put the two halves opposite each other like two aisles, right? And the blood of those animals is going to flow into the aisle and it's going to make a little stream of blood. And the two people making a covenant are going to put on long white robes, uh, robes that are so long that they drag on the ground, and they're going to go hand in hand or elbow in elbow, whatever it is, down this aisle and get blood on the bottom of their robes. And then they're not going to wear those robes, because who wants to wear bloody robes around? You're going to hang that up somewhere important, or you're going to cut that hem off and put it somewhere important in your house. And that's to always remind you, it's like a sign that when you look at it, you're reminded of that covenant. And if you break that covenant, that blood that's on the hem of that robe is a reminder that it's your blood on the line for that covenant. So when God makes this covenant with Abraham, what we expect to happen is Yahweh to show up, wake up Abraham, and walk through the covenant together with him. What happens instead? But the sun goes down and it was dark, and behold, a smoking fire pot. So if you have a pot that has smoke coming out of it, what's it going to look like? It's going to look like a pillar. Okay, so you have a pillar of smoke, and then you have a flaming torch. And those two things pass through the pieces of the covenant. It was not God and Abraham. It was God appearing as a pillar of smoke and a pillar of fire Ooh, prequels, here we go, passing through the covenant. So whose blood is on the line if this covenant is broken? Only God's. That's, yes, totally the same thing. That's 100% what's going on, except that that one I would argue is more related to the Mosaic covenant because of Matthew 5, 17, but it's totally the same picture, um, that God is making a promise that no matter what happens, it is my blood on the line if this covenant doesn't come to pass. So I'm making a covenant that I'm going to make you a great nation. You're going to have many offspring. These are going to be the borders of your land, everything that you can see, north, south, east, and west. And if it doesn't happen, you can kill me. That's why a covenant is so important. Yep. Okay. Um, pause. Go over here. Okay. I would do that. Um, so we went over the Noahic covenant uh, last week. We talked about um, how it is the parties are God and Noah and his family and animals and all creation. The terms of the covenant were unconditional. Noah didn't have to do anything uh, for his side of the covenant. God was just going to do it, and he made the sign of the rainbow. So now we have this Abrahamic covenant. Who are the parties involved in the Abrahamic covenant? Certainly God. And then we have uh, Abram or Abraham. I'm writing Abram because it's shorter and it saves me space. Um, he is still Abram. Um, now, you could say his family, and I think that that is appropriate to say, um, especially given that the covenant concerns his offspring. But then there's going to be some argument to be made for why the covenant is continually renewed with his sons. Um, but I think it's okay to go ahead and just say, and offspring. I think that that's the direction we can take this and is a really good way to understand it. Does God say that Abraham needs to do anything for this covenant to happen? Some said no, some said yes. Okay, this one is funny because what did he tell Abraham to do in chapter 12? Go, right? So if Abraham doesn't go, is this going to happen? Mm, maybe. 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 But then he would have been in Haran, and then how would God have promised him the land? Right? So I'm going to... Mm, here's how I, would, I think I want to express the Abrahamic covenant. It seems like there were conditions on Abraham that were fulfilled by faith. He believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. But those same conditions don't seem to exist on other people who would enter into this covenant. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to say, generally speaking, the Abrahamic covenant is unconditional. Now, we are about to hit chapter 17, which is all about... Yeah, thanks, Mom. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, 
We're here to talk. Yep. Um, does that place a condition on the Abrahamic covenant? If you have to be circumcised to be part of the covenant, doesn't that kind of place a condition on it? Okay, let's see what it says. Um, y'all read chapter 16, Sarai and Hagar and the, the sexual abuse followed by emotional abuse of their servant girl, and it was just this whole messed up situation. Um, cool? I mean, not cool? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Yes. They do. Yeah. Yes. God cares about a lot of rebellious people. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, Mark, you just summarized the gospel. God seems to care about them, yet they seem to be rebellious. Like, that's the biblical story, man. <laughs> That's the whole thing, yeah. I'm, I'm in that list. If that's, if that's the qualifier, here we are, right? Um, yeah, they're all, well, everyone's ites. Um, oh, so the one cool thing in here, um, where's Beer Lahai Roy? Uh, there it is. So uh, Hagar, who, the servant girl who has just been sexually and emotionally abused by her owner and uh, the wife of her owner, who arguably is her owner and the husband of her owner. I don't know how all that works out. Um, Yahweh comes to her, right? So this is like um, just relationally huge that Yahweh comes to her and, and uh, she called on the name of Yahweh and said, you are a God of seeing. For she said, truly here, I have seen him who looks after me. Uh, therefore, the well was called Bir Lahairoi. Um, now, this is, um, th th it's, this is a really complicated thing to translate into English. But uh, er lahairoi, it um, most literally, so beer means well. The way I remember that is if you go to a bar and ask for a well drink, they're gonna give you a beer. You don't have to drink. That's just my mnemonic device, okay? Um, so beer, and then lachai, uh, le is, is a, a Hebrew, like, preposition to, and chai means life. Have you ever, like, heard or, or watched, like, Fiddler on the Roof, and when they're partying, they all say, lachayim, it means to life. So lachai. And then roi, uh, ra, is to see. And Roe is the one who sees, or, or like, you could argue my seer, but there's some grammatical things going on there. So this is like the well of the living, seeing God. The well of the living God who sees. And that's lost in the English translation, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, also, um, Yira, um, so, uh, is my son's name if he was Hebrew. So Jera is Germanic because Hebrews don't have a J sound. So Yira is where his name comes from. It's Yahweh who sees. So that's, that's important for me to point out because it's my son's name. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, should we talk about the angel of the Lord? Let's come back to that if we have time because um, I want to get through covenants. That's going to be important as we keep going. Um, so uh, Abraham's 99 years old. Hold on. He was 86 years old when Hagar was when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram, he was 86 years old. That's what verse 16 of the last chapter says, which means that there are 13 years of silence right here. And this actually happens in the life of Abraham a lot, and we just sort of miss it because we pass over it. So I wanted to point it out really quickly. There are long periods of silence where Abraham either doesn't meet with God or it's just not recorded. Um, and so that I feel like it's, it's, it's a thing for me that I feel like is important um, to just keep in mind when, like, it's an applicational thing. That sometimes you're not hearing from God. You're still okay, right? Anyways, um, when Abraham was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Where have we seen a blameless person before? Noah and in the garden. Yeah, great. Uh, specifically, the word blameless comes up with Noah, but it's all connecting back into uh, that garden Edenic king priest person. Um, and so this is uh, being blameless is, is further connected to Abram being this uh, offspring. And I'm going to make a covenant uh, between me and you 
and I'm going to multiply you greatly. And Abram fell on his face, and uh, God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you. You'll be the father of a multitude of nations. We've, that's the same language we've been reading in the last few chapters. No longer shall you be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. And um, Abram, Avram, Av means father, and, and then Ham means it, it's adding essentially multitudes to his name. Um, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I, oh, where have we seen that before? Being fruitful, multiplying, fill the earth, right? So he, he is the guy, according to this covenant, that's going to be the fulfillment of that blessing. That was the first thing that God told Adam and Eve, and also fish and birds, but that's beside the point. Uh, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I'll make you into nations, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant with you and with your offspring, and I will give you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. That is such a hugely important line, is that prophecy of fellowship. I will be their God. Um, this is going to come up again in Exodus. It, it's, it's when God rescues the people out of uh, Egypt, he says, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. Um, this line right here takes us all the way. I just want to kind of uh, jump to the end of the book for a second and reveal my hand as the story lays out. Um, this is Revelation 21, verse 3. This is the new creation, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. Uh, Revelation 21, verse 3, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. This right here in the new creation is like the culmination of the Old Testament promise. And I love that so much. I just have to go to it because it's awesome. Um, back to Genesis 17. I will be their God. As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring through all their generations. This is my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. So is it a covenantal term that they must be circumcised? Let's keep reading. Uh, you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. It shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So is it a term of the covenant or is it a sign of the covenant? It seems to me, what am I doing? That's what I'm doing. Okay. It seems to me that this is going over here in the signs. Circumcision. Nailed it. Um, Abram, Abraham had some things that he needed to do in order to make this covenant happen. And I would argue that he didn't do them by works because he believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. We can say that he did them by faith. And then anyone else who wants to participate in this covenant has to be circumcised. Now we're talking about men. This isn't female circumcision. It's nothing that's going on like that, um, which maybe I only bring up because of ministry in Uganda, and that's not such an important thing to say here. Um, but this is male circumcision. Uh, he says here in verse 12, every male throughout all your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money or any foreigner who is not of your offspring. So who is involved now in the Abrahamic covenant? Abraham, offspring, and um, so Abraham and his offspring, we call them Hebrews or Jews. So we also have plus Gentiles. What does this mean about all those nations that Israel is going to go dispossess in the land of Canaan? That they could get circumcised and be part of this covenant and become part of the offspring of Abraham. Are you with me? So is this the kind of the first signs or the first telling of this plan of God to bring redemption to Gentiles? I think that's exactly what's going on here. Um, whether born in your house, bought with money, foreigner, both he who is born in your house shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He's broken my covenant. So, if you want to be part of Israel, what's the requirement? You've got to be circumcised. And if you don't, you're going to be cut off from the people. Are you going to be killed? Well, you'll just be cut off from the people. You just won't be part of Israel. You won't be part of this covenant, right? So, um, 
Is the Abrahamic covenant conditional or unconditional? It sounds conditional. Uh, I like to think about it this way. There is a condition to enter into the Abrahamic covenant. Once that condition has been met, there is, it, it can never be undone. That's a thing. Like once you do it, you're done, right? So once that condition is met, it can never be undone and you are part of that covenant forever. And then there's nothing you can ever do to ever not be part of that covenant again because that thing is done and it can't be undone. So, yes, circumcision is a shadow of salvation. That's exactly where I wanted to go with this. The circumcision of the flesh, which is, by the way, the uncovering of a man's nakedness, to put it in terms of biblical themes, is uh, later on in the prophets Jeremiah and Isaiah are going to describe it as the circumcision of the heart, which is exactly what's required for salvation, is for something to be cut off to make room, make room for something else. Maybe that's not the best way to say it, but it, it is the picture of salvation. Yeah, absolutely. You totally could make a religion out of this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think this is as big of an issue here in the U.S., but in Uganda, there's a big thing with when, when you get saved, should you be circumcised? There's whole clinics in Kampala who are dedicated to doing adult circumcisions for guys uh, because they get saved and then think they have to be circumcised. And it's, it's both kind of a sad thing, but at the same time, it's like it's, it's sad because you don't understand the heart level, the spiritual thing of what's going on. But at the same time, it's like even as an adult, there's nothing wrong with getting circumcised. It's just like understand what's happening. Understand that this is a message for your heart, not, not physically, but spiritually. Yeah. You got to speak up because the AC just came on. I can't hear you. You have to speak louder. There are going to be things when we get to Leviticus, other ways of being cut off, but specifically in the Abrahamic covenant. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, just because you're circumcised doesn't mean you can go worship any God you want and still be good. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with conditional entry into the covenant. You have to be circumcised in the flesh to be part of the Abrahamic covenant if you're a male. Um, being in a patriarchal culture, the females would just kind of go along with the male. If your husband was circumcised, you would enter in. Yeah, it's not conditional in the way the Mosaic Covenant is when we talk about that later. But it, it, it has a condition for entrance. But then once you're in, you're in. And you can't lose that. It's not conditional in that sense. Yes, yes. Ooh. <laughs> no, but you're right. Yeah. So this is a bad example because in the context of circumcision, we're talking about males. But to answer that question, I want you to think about Rahab in Joshua. When she's saved after Jericho falls down, she becomes part of the nation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then um, the nations, uh, not the seven nations who Israel was supposed to wipe out as they conquered the land of Canaan, but any other surrounding nations before they went to war against them, they were supposed to attempt to evangelize and proselytize in those nations to win them over to God before they were wiped out. Yeah. So yes, yeah, to answer that question, yes. Other, other people, there, there is multiple ways. How do I want to say this? There are multiple times where we see God trying to bring non-Israelites into his covenant people. Uh-huh. From any foreigner. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, that's a good point. In this specific verse, it does say that. There are going to be, as we work through 
Um, especially, I think, like Exodus uh, 21 and 22, we're going to see, um, like, Gentiles, like, means of bringing Gentiles into Israel and making them a part of Israel. We're going to see it in Numbers 19. We're going to see it uh, in, um, not in the feasts, in the purity uh, offerings in Leviticus. There's multiple times where we see, like, God's mission is not just to isolate Israel. They're not his chosen people just for the sake of being his chosen people. But the idea of being a nation of priests is mediators for other nations where they're going to bring in other nations into the covenant people of God. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Because this verse, it is a little unclear as you, as you pointed out. Yeah. But Israel, uh, Ishmael is going to be circumcised. Yeah. Uh-huh. Sure. Do you know how many sons Ishmael has? He has 12. He has 12 sons just like Jacob. Yeah. And I would say they're right about that. But what's the big difference between me and, and I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, generalize, but Muhammad, like what's the difference? It's Jesus, right? Yeah. Yeah. But the difference the difference can be Jesus, even if the commonality is Abraham. So it seems like through the circumcision, Ishmael is a participant in the Abrahamic covenant, right? It kind of breaks off and we stop hearing about him. And so it's, it's sort of a meaningless debate, but he, he does get circumcised and participate in the covenant. Yeah. Um, and then Isaac's birth is promised uh, at the end of 17. Um, so God changed Abram's name to Abraham. Now he changes Sarai's name to Sarah. Uh, he says, I'll bless her. I'll give you a son by her. I'll establish my covenant with Isaac down here in verse 21. So we see this prophecy of the carrying on of the Abrahamic covenant with the children of Abraham. Um, and when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all those born in his house are bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins on that very day. And that stinks for Ishmael because he'd have been 13. Everyone else gets it when they're eight days old, so they don't remember it. But Ishmael would have been like, yeah, thanks, Dad. Um, and Abraham was 99 years old when he circumcised the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael, his son, was 13. Um, that very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. That's where we're going to stop uh, tonight. So um, in preparation for next week, where we start reading chapter 18, and we're going to see some things about how Hebrew people think about God. Um, how did God show up in Genesis chapter 15? He was a smoking pot and a flaming torch, which I related then to the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire, which we're going to see in the exodus from Egypt. Um, but just keep that in mind. Remember that, that, that the the glory of God. So glory uh, is, is kavod. It means weight. It means heaviness, but it also is expressing uh, the presence of something, the manifestation of God. The glory of God was smoke and fire, okay? Keep that in mind. We're going to expand on that a lot next week. Um, man, because I was under the weather this weekend, I didn't prepare a discussion question for the week. Um, What's that? No, we've had lots of good discussions. I tell you what, I will, I'm going to think about the class tonight and I'll send something out in the email tomorrow for you to think about throughout the week. Um, sorry, I didn't get that done in time. Um, and then, oh yeah, and the YouTube link, I'll send that out. 
So for next week, read chapters 18 through 28. So if you thought tonight we covered a lot of ground, we're going to really fly next week um, and get through some big stories, uh, stopping in only a couple of places. Right. Yeah, yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. Let me play uh, advocate for Abraham for just a moment. It also took God an awful long time to fulfill his promise of giving him a kid. So I might not have been the most, uh, you know, sit, sitting at his feet. Yeah, right. Yeah. Ideally, yeah, don't give up. <laughs> um, it is eight on the dot. Uh, Mark, would you like to pray for us?